Well, I don't know how much this will uh, help you at field day. I mean, unless uh, you might be using open wire line at field day. I don't know. But uh, hams uh, still use open wire line, of course, and uh, and uh, and probably could be using it in more situations than they realize. And that's what, of course, this talk may show you. And by the way, as you'll see at the bottom of the screen here, you don't need to write anything down that you may see in this presentation. You can obtain all of these slides, the very slides you're seeing here right now, just by going to my website, w6nbc.com, and putting slash slides after it. And all of the slides you're seeing here today will come down to you as a PDF document. So anything that you don't have to rush off, find a pen and, pe pen and paper and so forth to write, it, write anything down. Just download the slides, w6nbc.com slash slides. Today we're going to go, a la the Star Trek Enterprise here, zooming over some distant planet, planet far in the galaxy. We're going to go where open wire line has never gone before because open wire line is somewhat of an, an enigma to hams. Even though it's been around for a long time and it's still being used, it still is in a category where hams kind of avoid it. And we're going to try to take some of that mystery out of it for you. Not as some great big, not as some great big laboratory demonstration. I have I, my degrees are in physics, so I don't uh, have any problem with doing things in a technical level. But I'm a ham. I like to do things at ham level. So that's what we're going to do today here give you a very ham demonstration of open wire line and take it into places you might think that it shouldn't be shouldn't be taken. Well, you all know that in the early days of radio, open wire line was really king. This is kind of the first method that hams and even commercial radio operators had of getting the signal from the transmitter out to the antenna. You can see this early station here, even before the 1910 conference uh, that put call sign, put a prefix on the end of all call signs. Most countries were running without a prefix before 1910. That was when the when they were all established, when we got W, N, and K as the prefixes for our call signs. And, uh, and other countries got other prefixes, Canada, B, E, for example, Britain, G, and, and, uh, and uh, M. But um, there's a station in the early days before he had a before he had a prefix. He was just three ABT, and very very likely he used open wire line in those days because it was king in those days. Coax hadn't even been invented yet in in the early days of radio. But open wire line, as you see here, this is a pretty extreme example of open wire line. But this is definitely open wire line. There's no coax being used here. This is open wire line feeding this big broadcast tower, probably an AM AM radio station out there at the end on the right. The transmitter, though, is probably not out there at the at the antenna where it, it is in many cases. It's probably back some distance, and so they're feeding the power out to that broadcast antenna with open wire line to avoid loss. And of course, that's what as we many hams realize, is one of the benefits of open wire line is that it is low loss. Now, don't think that open wire line is no loss. That's a big myth that a lot of hams carry around with them, that open wire line doesn't have any loss. Oh, yes, it does. All transmission line has loss. It's just that open wire line has less loss than most other forms of, of transmission line, such as, such as coax. And the bigger the transmission line, the more farther apart the lines are, the less loss it has. But it has loss, definitely. Today, however, most, most of us and most commercial radio prefer to use coax. Uh, it, it has some definite benefits, mainly its shielding properties compared to open wire line. But you might ask, why did we change over from open wire line to, uh, to coax. Well, it basically happened during the Second World War. 
Here's a picture of a couple of German soldiers in the trenches during the Second World War. It was during this time that coax really began to be used mainly as the primary transmission line for RF, for feeding energy from the transmitter to the antenna. And I don't think they were using any coax or open wire line here in this in this picture. It's just symbolic picture of the Second World War of when the uh, of when coax began to replace open wire line wholesale. In fact, it was right after the Second World War in 1945 when Amphenol Corporation, which all of you recognize the name, of course, uh, began to advertise and sell coax. And they had their first ads. This is an ad from 1945 QST magazine for coax. And when hams were introduced to coaxial cable. And from that point onward, after the Second World War, uh, hams rapidly went away from open wire line to coaxial cable. To this day, this is our favorite form of transmission line. However, hams still do use open wire line, principally because they realize it is open or it is low loss, not no loss. Don't ever think that open wire line is no loss. It is not no loss. It's just low loss compared to compared to coax. Actually, in some cases, it is an even low low loss compared to coax, as I'm going to show you here in a minute. But here are the three common types of of open wire transmission lines that hams may use today. Some of some some of us still use 300 ohm TV ribbon line which was the common method to get signals down from broadcast television aerials back in the back in the uh, in 1950s if you remember uh, tv aerials from those days and it's from those days we used this 300 ohm ribbon cable to get the signal down from antennas back there only more recently most tv antennas if you're still using an antenna uh use 75 ohm coax instead but hams today uh, typically use 450 ohm slotted ladder line, which you see there in the middle. That's pr perhaps the most dominant form of open wire transmission line that hams use, although many hams still use 600 ohm line. And uh, you see there on the left some homemade 600 ohm line. And a lot of hams build their own 600 ohm line. And it's easy enough to build with, you know, popsicle sticks or soda straws or even pieces of wood and so forth. I like a I like the product shown there on the lower on the lower right called ladder snap. You can buy that in bags. It's just uh, injection molded plastic spreaders that you can buy readily, and they're relatively inexpensive. And they're made to just you know, they companion with twelve gauge solid copper wire, and all you do is snap them on to twelve gauge. They got a nice little thing at the end that snaps right onto twelve gauge wire, and you can quickly make. 600 ohm ladder line out of ladder snap. And you can buy a bag of them for quite a relatively inexpensive inexpensive price. I like that product. I'm not, I have no interest in the company. I just happen to like it. Now here's a rather meaningful table. This is a table showing you loss in transmission line from 80 meters up to 10 meters, which is the HF band, and then two meters, which is the VHF band that we use, and 70 centimeters or, or 400, 440. The UH band, that, these are the bands that we most commonly use. And this is 100 feet of cable, whether it be coax or open wire line. And of course, these lines, these figures are shown for the line properly terminated. That means it's either got a proper antenna out at the other end so that the SWR is one to one in the line. There's no SWR in the line, and or it's got a fifth, it's got a proper resistor at the other end, 50 ohm resistor for coax or 400 for 450 ohm resistor for ladder line or whatever. So these are the in fact these are the tables you'll find in radio books showing you the loss in coax. When you go to a radio book like the ARRL handbook for and look up the loss in transmission line, it will always be for properly terminated transmission line. And that's something you must know. When the line isn't properly terminated, then the loss gets much higher because coax or any transmission line hates 
SWR. So if you so keeping the SWR low in transmission line is very important. So if you ever look up the loss in transmission line, it's always in proper terminated line. Anyway, this is a little chart here, which I want to show you because there's something interesting here. This is for 100 feet of line, for 80 meters, 10 meters, 2 meters, and 440. It's, and I show you five different transmission lines, four co uh, three coaxes, and two open wire lines. RG58, which is a coax I rarely use because it's very low loss, very high loss. Notice that even at 80 meters, you're losing up to a dB of loss in 100 feet. At 70 centimeters, you're losing 13 d, 13 dB. In other words, only on one quarter of the power is getting out to the end of your, getting out to the end of your uh, transmission line if you're running 100 feet of RG58 at 450 at, at 440. RG8 is uh, considerably better, as you can see. For 80 meters, you're only losing three tenths of a dB uh, at, a, at a 100 feet. But it, for 440, notice that the other end of the of the most common band, we're losing over half the power in 100 feet of RG8. So you want you might take a look at this chart. It's kind of meaningful. But now let's come down here. You might say, well, I use lower loss, better better coax like LMR 400. That's real good coax. That's the coax I prefer in larger coax. And it's better than RG8. Oh, it's the same size as RG8. It's the same size as RG8 or RG211. But notice it's better by about 50%. And you'll only, you'll, you'll only not quite lose half your power in 100 feet of LMR400 at 70 centimeters. But now let's look at the open wire transmission line. And it shows you that don't ever think that open wire line has no loss. Oh, it definitely has loss. Look at 300 ohm ribbon. That's what it's right below. 300 ohm ribbon has almost exactly the same loss as LMR 400 coax and not much more loss than RG8. So if you think you're going to get away with a uh, with lot less loss by running 300 ohm ribbon, uh, think again. Coax may do you just as well. Look at the 450 ohm ladder line at the bottom, though. It's considerably better than any coax you can buy. So definitely advantage to using open wire line, even 450 ohm. 600 ohm line is even better, even better than that. Cams, however, oop, that's my second up. The UPS man must be making a delivery. <laughs> Pardon the dog RM, QRM from the dog. <laughs> Hams are afraid of open wire line. They consider open wire line sort of like, like it was demon ladder line. You know, I can't use open wire line. I'll, if I do, I'll get in trouble. I'll do all sorts of things. And it'll give me bad results if I don't do it right. Well, I'm here to tell you today, that's not true. Open wire line is not demon line. It's very useful and very valuable. And in fact, can be used almost anywhere you can use coax if you just know how to use it properly. And you may think you know how to use it properly, but chances are you don't know how to use it proper, properly. And that's what we're going to show you today here. Many hams think that all open wire line must be used either in one of these two ways. If it's 300 ohm ribbon cable, then you have to put it on standoffs like over on the left. And these were the standoffs we commonly used back in, in the 50s when we ran our ribbon cable into our house. It, but in other words, you have, to, you have to keep it all up in the open air or it won't work right. Or if you're running 600 ohm uh, uh, open wire line, like you see on the right there, it has to be away from everything, all out in the open air, or it won't work right. Is that true? It is not true. It can be used in places where you wouldn't imagine you can use either one of those. And quite satisfactorily, I'm going to show you here today how to do it. Most hams, when we talk about open wire line, would never, ever dream of laying open wire line on top of a metal roof. That, that, that's a big no-no. And of course, you would never put open wire line inside of a metal conduit. Oh, that would be a terrible no-no. 
many hams would even think, I can't even run it through a wall safely or over the edge of a, of a metal window frame. Oh, that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing to do with open wire line. But worst of all, I'd certainly never lay it right on the ground or run it right right on the soil, right through a flower garden, right through a, a, a flower bed. Would you ever run open wire line lying right on the ground in your in a flower bed? Most hams would say, heavens, no, I'd never do that. But worst of all, would you ever bury open wire line? Most hams, were, hams would tear their hair out if you suggested to them that you did that. But I'm here to tell you, you can do all of these very safely if you just know how. So I ask the question, can we violate this common wisdom that you can only use open wire line if you hang it up in the free air or put it on standoffs? And the answer is yes, we definitely can violate this common wisdom. But I, I used to believe these myths because they are myths. But one day at Breck had ham breakfast, I asked this simple question, you know, I wonder what would happen if you were to bury open wire line? And we kicked it around the table and nobody had a satisfactory answer. So I decided, what the heck, I'll go home and try it out and see if I can measure it and find out in some sort of simple, practical way and see what the difference would be for some, if a piece of open wire line, some 450 ohm ladder line, I had, I had quite a bit of it. If I just put it in open air, made some measurements on it, and then buried it, how different would it be? Now, these were not laboratory experiments. I don't run the National Physics Laboratory. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to conduct super technical tests here. Just some simple ham comparisons. How does a piece of open wire line buried underground compared to a piece of open wire line in the open air? I wanted to test that in some simple yet scientifically accurate way. And that's what you're going to see here. In fact, I wrote an article back in August 2018, QST, on this very topic, which you can get from the ARRL archive if you want. But it's essentially what you're seeing here tonight in this presentation. Really, if you want to use open wire line in conditions where you normally think only coax will work, you can do it if you, if you observe two primary must-dos. The must-dos are you must keep the, co the open wire line dry and you must keep it at a reasonable distance away from whatever environment that you're putting it in. Now, what's that reasonable distance? Well, I'll answer it quickly for you here. And it's not as much as you think it is. It's only approximately the same distance away from whatever the environment is, a metal roof, the soil, you know, a, a picture frame, a window frame, uh, the wall, or whatever it is, a piece of conduit. It's only just barely just the same distance, as long as you keep it away from those environmental uh, factors, the same distance as the width of the two wires is apart. In other words, three-quarter inch ladder, open wire ladder line, slotted ladder line, 450 ohm slotted ladder line, is three-quarters of an inch thick. Why? That's the separation between the wires. If you keep that ladder line at least three-quarters of a way, inch away from any environment, that's all you have to do. Then it'll work just as well as coax, as long as you also keep it dry. Those are the only two only two requirements to use ladder line where you use coax. First of all, let's look at the moisture factor here of these two. I'm showing you 100 feet of 450 ohm ladder line, 450 ohm slotted window line, 100 feet, and it's properly terminated with a with a 450 ohm load for this graph, so it's uh, so these are proper loss factors, and we see the loss in in dB on the left from 0.1 to 1 dB, so relatively low in a properly terminated uh, uh, 450 ohm line. Notice though how much moisture affects this line. The dry line is considerably better than a frosty line 
And the frosty line is quite a bit better than a wet line, one that, the line that's been rained on. So it's pretty obvious that keeping open wire line dry is important. Why, is, why does the water affect it? It's because the water has a lot of loss in it. It's a lossy material. It's a polar, it's a polar material that, that, that it's absorbs the energy in the line. So keeping it dry is important. And this is over the range, this graph you'll see at the bottom, from one megahertz to 100 megahertz. Uh, loss, loss of 0.1 to 1 dB in this particular chart. So you can see how important the keeping it dry is. Okay, here's the solution to both of your problems of keeping it dry and keeping it spaced away from the environment. Go down to your hardware store and buy some of this gray foam insulating material that is used to keep hot water pipes warm in a house. You, you probably know what this stuff is, and you can find it in most any hardware store. And it's just gray plastic polyethylene foam. Polyethylene is a good plastic, so the plastic is no, no problem. It's the same material that the line itself is made out of. It's just a foam, foam version of it. And it, uh, you, can, you can buy it in 10-foot lengths. It has a nice hole down the middle of it, which is just the right size for the slotted line. And you put it inside, and that will solve both of the problems. If you wrap 450 ohm line, put it inside of that 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 foam material, which, by the way, is waterproof. The, the, the bubbles in the foam are not connected. This is not like the bubbles in a common sponge that you wipe your sink down with. The bubbles there are connected, so they'll pick up water. The bubbles in this foam are called unicellular. They're not connected. So this foam is waterproof. Water won't go through this foam. So this is unicellular or closed cell water pipe insulation. And you can get it it's for covering up half inch water pipe. But you can get it down at the at your insulating half inch water pipe. Comes in 10 foot sections. If you want to make longer sections of it, just buy yourself some waterproof tape and tape the sections together and tape the slit down the edge of it together. What you're doing is you're making yourself slotted line coax is really what you're making without the outer jacket on it. This is the insulation and the uh, of, of slotted line coax is what you're building. You're turning the slotted line into a type of coax. So here's the simple test setup that I use. Not a, not a laboratory setup, just a simple ham type setup, but it proves the point to me. It proved it to me beyond any doubt that you can use slotted or that you can use ladder line, open line, pretty much anywhere you can use coax. Here's the test setup. Let me get this little bar out of the way here. Okay. I have a VNA. In fact, I have several little VNAs. I have one of the little nano VNAs. In fact, I have two of them sitting right on the shelf over there. Uh, they're a nice little device. If you haven't gotten used to one, you ought to buy one. They're a great little measurement tool. They're a 50 ohm device. I wanted to couple it to to the 450 ohm line, so I had to build a ballon. I could have bought a ballon, a nine to one ballon, but uh, but I decided to build myself one, which I did. Either one would have worked fine. A, a, a nine to one choke ballon would have would have, have, have any commercial one or a home built one. I built one at home. And then I took 10 foot of the slotted line and 10 foot of the foam insulation, put it on the line. And then at the other end, at the other end of the 10 foot of slotted line, I short circuited, short circuited it. Why did I do that? That's so I would have an infinite SWR. The SWR would have been a, a zillion to one with a short circuit. In other words, all of the energy going down the line would bounce off the short and come back. So that, that and that's what SWR is, how much of the line of the signal goes down and comes back. If none of it comes back, the, the SWR is one to one. If all of it comes back, then the SWR is infinite. So that, so that's how SWR is determined. If you make a shorted a 10 foot, so I've had a 10 foot shorted length of 450 ohm line. So in other words, an infinite SWR. Then with my VNA through the ballon, I did a test which is called return loss. Return loss is just a measure of how much of the, of the signal bounces off the other end. In other words, the SWR. 
Uh, so that's one of the measurements of VNA can make. It'll measure SWR, but it'll also measure this one, one characteristic called return loss. Return loss is the primary ingredient of SWR. So by making an SWR uh, a return loss reading and taking half of it, the return loss is always measured in dB. I take half of it because it's making two trips. It's traveling down the line, off reflecting off the short and then coming back. So half of the return loss is the amount of loss I would get in the line as measured by, by the VNA. So half of the return loss told me how much loss I was getting in that 10 foot of, ladder, of slotted ladder line with the foam insulation on it. This was my test setup. Then I took that test setup out and I put that 450 ohm line in several different situations to see how much loss I would get. An ideal situation and several non-ideal situations. Not laboratory standard, just enough to show whether doing bad things that hams think is going to cause me a big problem. That's all I wanted to find out. I didn't want to prove it down to a fraction of a dB. I just want to, want to prove in general whether these common myths about open wire line are really true or not. Here's my ballot. I had some FT240 mix 43 through HF, HF 2.4 inch diameter ferrite uh, uh, toroids. And I wound each one of them with the right number of turns to make a one-to-one, one-to-one choke ballon. And then I wound at three of them. So I wound the primary of the of the windings. I connected them in parallel to go on the 50 ohm side, which hooks to the SO239. And then I wound the secondary of those bifilar windings in series to give me the nine to one or 450 ohms. So this is a nine to one choke current ballot. You can buy one if you want. You could, I could have bought one, but I, I, since I had the toroids, I decided to make it. And of course, the 450 ohm side hooks up to a, a banana, double banana jack, which was easy to put on the end of the 450 ohm ladder line. And here are my four conditions to just prove the point, not to do it from laboratory standard, but just to prove the point. Do these three bad conditions give me terrible results Whereas the one on the right, which is something like the right, right conditions, give me good results. And as you can see, the right condition is with the line held up with, with, with two stools and two chairs to keep it off the ground. The other three are, in, are, are done in the same place. This is my patio out to the side of my mobile home. It has an aluminum cover off the side, uh, over the top and a, and, a, and a bit of a garden patch on the, on the right, to the right there and a concrete slab on the bottom. And so those these were my four test cir circumstances. One lying right straight on the concrete, one lying right in the wet soil, right next to the patio. And the third situation, I took it and put it up on top of the metal roof. If any one of those showed a big difference in the, in the amount of signal loss in the return loss measurement made by the VNA, which you can see, it's right over here, that's the VNA, that's the ballon right there. That's the line going back to my computer, uh, so forth. And you can see them. There's the there's the ballon again in each case. There's the slot. There's the foam covering up the line. I wanted to see how all of those four different circumstances, of those three bad circumstances, which most hams would never think of doing. This is pretty equivalent to burying it in the ground, compared to this one. If this one was much better, then I knew that hams were right. But if this one wasn't much better, then I knew hams were wrong. That's all. Simple ham level experiment. And here's my here's my raw data all plotted for you from from uh, over the over all the HF uh, the HF band from two megahertz to twenty eight megahertz. The four curves that you see there are the four conditions including the, in good air and the three of them in the bad conditions. How much difference do you see? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. Long as you keep that line dry and keep it separated by the width of the two conductors, there isn't 
any difference to speak of. Certainly not enough to mention. And yet most hams would have thought I would have gotten terrible results. You might ask, what's that big bump in the curve? That's just the natural resonance of 10 feet of slotted line. It, it's, not, it's not meaningful in this, uh, in this particular graph. It's just the natural uh, resonant frequency of the 10 feet of line. Here I put it as a, as, a, as a graph to show you how little difference there is. Open air is the black, is the black curve. Interesting. When I put it inside, you know, I didn't show you this one. When I put it inside of a piece of two-inch EMT conduit, it was actually better. I got less loss than when it was up there on top of the stools. That, I still don't know quite why that why that is, but that was true. Inside of the metal conduit, it was actually a little better. Buried in the ground, it was only 0.05 dB difference. And, and lying on the concrete was the worst but it was only 0.3 dB difference in, in uh, 10 feet. This isn't worth the powder and shot to blow it up. Why should I worry about this slotted ladder line being used in these adverse conditions? Long as I got it protected with that foam, it's perfectly able, able to be used in those circumstances. Actually, what I was doing was creating a new type of coax. Well, it wasn't new because there's been a coax around for years where you've got a double conductor uh, transmission line inside of a jacket. It's called twin ax. You don't see it much anymore. It's a hundred ohm twin coax that was inside of a jacket. Used to be used in the early days of computers. I happen to have some, but uh, but it isn't, you don't find it much anymore. I got on to using ladder line this way when I developed this this 20 foot flagpole, which is being sold commercially these days, which is a half wavelength off-center fed flagpole, works very well by the way, which has two insulators in it. It's fed, it's fed coaxially, it's a half wave, half wave off-center fed vertical dipole with an insulator at the bottom because it's a half wave, not a quarter wave. It has no radials and it's fed off-center fed by the slotted ladder line, which you can barely see at the bottom down here. This is the slotted ladder line right here right here, uh, feeds up, connects to the center point right here. And there's another insulator down here at the bottom, two fiberglass insulators. And the line is going off through my flower garden inside the foam. Works just great. In those days, though, I wasn't using the foam, actually. I was using spacers. But you can use spacers if you want. You don't have to use the foam. You can use spacers. The advantage of the foam is, though, it helps you keep the line it keeps the, keep the line dry, or you can just use little cut off pieces of pool noodle. They work pretty well to space the, the ladder line. Pool noodle, however, uh, is uh, not uh, waterproof. One of my readers sent me these two pictures of him using my technique of uh, using the, the foam out in the, uh, out in the garden. There he's burying it in the ground inside of a piece of PVC pipe. You can run that 450 ohm line buried underground in PVC pipe or in metal conduit great distances and get very low loss. Okay, I think you now see you don't need to be afraid of open wire line. It can be used in all sorts of places you didn't think you can. In closing, I want to give you a little extra presentation here, which is not about, uh, about how to use open wire line. I just want to take you on a little trip, which I think you'll enjoy, though, uh, to a place which you probably have never seen, and uh, which, but which, where open wire, open wire line is still being used in a very interesting way. This is a, this is a uh, national park or national, uh, run by the National Park Service. It's the last remaining CW ship to shore radio station. Operate on, operating on 500 kilohertz. It's located north of San Francisco, uh, on Point Reyes, north of, uh, north of San Francisco, at the Point Reyes uh, 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 Reserve up there. Maritime Radio Historical Society radio station shipped to shore CW Coastal Radio Station at Point Reyes. Open wire line is still king 
at this, and I thought I'd show it to you just as a bit of a bit of history to close this out. It's a different presentation, but I thought this would be fun as a little closing thing. It's located here north of San Francisco. San Francisco is on the tip of the peninsula, which you can see here in this picture, cross over the Golden Gate, and then the the Golden the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore Reserve there is a, a strip of land along the uh, coast there in Marin County. And uh, there are two sites up there that were built by the uh, by RCA back in the 1920s to do ship to shore radio communication with ships at shore, all by CW and uh, on 500 kilohertz. That's what they were using as radio frequencies in those days. Later, they added short wave to it, and they're still running. They, there used to be a, a station on the East Coast, but I think it's shut down now. So this is the last remaining CW ship to shore station. A good friend of mine who's now a silent key and I took a trip up there and I got to go on the air because I hold a commercial telegraph license. Here's one of the buildings up there, the receiver site where they have the receivers. The transmitter site is about 10 miles away, separated by a telephone line. Uh, they do this so they can listen to themselves talk. They operate from the receiver site and they put the transmitters on the transmitters on the air, 500 and 470 kilohertz on the air through through a phone line. And uh, I got to go on the air myself and actually transmit here from this building. These were built by RCA in 1922, I think. Still there today. You can visit this site any Saturday morning. They open up, they go on the air, they're still on the air every day, not only on 500 kilohertz, six shortwave frequencies, and uh, and and W6 KPH ham, ham frequencies. Here's my uh, good buddy, who's now a silent key on the left, Joe Peterson. Richard Dillman is one of the trustees of the station. That's one of the 500 kilohertz transmitters. They also have six shortwave transmitters that also simulcast the signals, all CW, and uh, they run, these are antenna tuners coming out of the six shortwave transmitters built by Henry Radio, by the way. And they run 2,000, they run, uh, yes, they run uh, uh, 2,000 ohm open wire line. And you can see the antenna tuners, you can see the open wire line coming out the top and the coax leading back to the transmitters going out through uh, uh, plastic windows at the top of the building. Here's the open wire line coming out of the top of the of that same building from the outside now, showing you the feed lines going out to the various shortwave and 500 kilohertz transmitters, uh, antennas at that site. In the early days, this was a long time, way back in the 20s, they had little telephone poles, always all running open wire line on insulators. Here it is today. That's one of the 500 kilohertz antennas uh, out there in the distance. And, these, and this is the transmission line feeding open wires, 2000 ohm transmission line, feeding the energy out to the 500 kilohertz transmitter antenna. There's me, since I hold a second class commercial telegraph operator's license, you can still get one of those, by the way. You can't get the first class unless you can put in a year's, uh, a year's uh, service at, at at a station, which is pretty hard to do anymore. Uh, I, I sort of thought I might do that once, but no. But they'll, at least you can operate the station with a second-class license. And that's what they let me do. They let me go on the air and send out their daily bulletin uh, on CW. Here I am in the in the receiver building at, the, at a Vibraplex, uh, which I can operate fairly well. And uh, I, I could hear myself through the headphones coming back from the transmitter building, transmitting simultaneously on, on 470 kilohertz, 500 kilohertz, and six shortwave frequencies with a total power of 18 kilowatts. That's the most power I've ever, tra ever transmitted with at one time simultaneously in CW. <laughs> that was quite an experience. Here's the station today. It's been expanded some. This is their uh, transmitting site now, including the ham station. You can see the ham rig in the uh, in the in one of the racks up there on top. This is W six KPH uh, from where it originally started in the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, 
and got chased out because the inhabitants of the of San Francisco didn't like all the ozone they were generating with their spark transmitters back in 1922. So they moved it out onto the coast. <laughs> so now you too know that you can go with open wire line where no hams have gone before. And here's my little doggy. Her name is Lolly. She's a Shih Tzu. Again, you can get a hold of me at w 6 and mail at gmail.com. Uh, that's my e email address. And you can get these slides at w6nbc.com. That's my website, slash slides. Dave wants to know, does the foam have to be black for sun resistance? Because he has some leftover light green foam from a pipe insulating project. Uh, you have to say that again. Uh, does, the, does the foam have to be black in color? No. Uh, no, that that foam, that particular foam that's used to insulate the the pipes uh, for hot water pipes, is is the foam to use because the bubbles in it don't connect, make it which makes it waterproof. If you use pool noodles, you know which are used in swimming pools uh, or, or other things, then then it's uh, but that all that stuff that you use on the pipe is gray. What are you holding up, Dave? Yeah, this, this is left over from a pipe insulating project. So this was meant specifically for insulating pipes, but it's not oh, black. Really? And, I, and I was thinking that the black stuff it would be sun resistant. So the question is, if I use this light That's green color out, outdoors, am I going to get into problems? Is the sun going to deteriorate it? Um, well, it may deteriorate some in the sun, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I, I It's polyethylene. Polyethylene is a is a pretty stable plastic, so it's not too it's not too subject to sun deterioration. But uh, this is not an area I can speak to too specifically. But it'll last a long time outside. Well, I guess. Well, I where did you get it, Where did you get that plastic? I, I I got it from the local hardware store. It did. I've not yeah, seen because, that white stuff because it was sold that... in bags of sections to use to insulate the hot water pipes and stuff in the basement. Oh, it's white. I've never seen the white stuff. Only stuff in my hardware stores is gray. It's not well, this black. Is, this is actually light green. It's a kind of a light lime color. Oh, okay. I uh, I haven't seen that. I'll have to take a look and see. My hardware store uh, only has the gray stuff. Now, some pl some plastic has some plastic, like the black ABS soil pipe has carbon in it which doesn't make it very good for RF purposes, but the gray stuff is just a dye, so it's it, it's fine. You need the closed cell foam. Closed cell foam, yes. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, it makes That's it waterproof. A, now, everything else was just commentary. No, no questions in chat now. Everything was just commentary. Back to you, Dan. All right, guys, get your hands up. You want to ask a question? No hands there's up. A, there's a I, hand up. From Frank. Uh, What's your, you have a question, good evening. Frank? Good evening, John. Good evening to everybody on the uh, uh, Zoom tonight. Uh, a number of years ago, I had a center-fed window. Uh, uh -huh. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. And uh, center fed, I, huh? Yeah, and, and it worked really great. I fed it with uh, two parallel runs of coaxial cable. And uh, I can't, it was a QST article from like the 60s that I duplicated, 55 foot of coaxial cable to this window. And of course, you take the center connectors, or I'm sorry, center conductors of those coaxes and connect them to the two antenna leg. You twist together the shield of the two coaxes uh, at the antenna, and then also at the base of those, or the feed line, the feed side of the, the two coaxes, you connect the two centers to your open wire uh, part of your tuner, which I happen to use a little Dentron, and the uh, coax side of it, the shield side of it, goes to ground. I had tremendous, and, and I had to use that. I couldn't feed it with open wire because of, I was on a second floor. It had to go out through all kinds of stuff, and at the time, I was paying attention to all the, you know, you don't do this with open wire. And uh, uh, so I used this coax, and it was just kind of draped through stuff, just like coax normally does. 
but it worked fabulously on that antenna. But I've had people tell me, you still have coax loss. In other words, you're not gaining the open wire characteristics of open wire because it's not open wire, it's coax. You still have the same amount of loss on that coaxial cable. How do you feel about that? I really can't address that uh, objectively, but I, I have heard of the technique. I'll have to look into I'm I'm afraid I'll, I'll have to beg off on answering that. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that method, I've seen the method, but I, I, I can't address it uh, technically uh, without looking at, looking at it a little bit more closely. I but, use uh, that for... I, 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 I don't, I tend to not think so. I tend to not think so. Not think so. What I do don't think you... I don't think you're experiencing coax loss in that. In that, just off the top of my head, I would suspect that that's not. You don't experience coax loss that way. So you're saying it probably is operating like twin, uh, like open wire. I do. Th I I'm. Uh, I tend to think that's probably what we're going to find if I what I would find if I looked into it. And I would tend to think that may be true because in those days. I didn't have a 100 watt transmitter. Everything I was doing was QRP and uh -huh. it worked fabulously. Yeah. I'll have to look at that. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that method. I've seen it in the past, but haven't looked at it in detail. I will. I'll take a look at it. Thanks for the, thanks for the uh, reference. Anybody else? Hey, Tom, you got your hand up. You want to take it away? I do. Can you hear me? I'm trying to get my camera on. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Two quick questions here. Why, why are some hams building 600 ohm line versus using the plastic readily available 450 ohm line? I, I know I a group of guys on 160 meters. They are 600 ohm. Uh, die hard open wire line users. I'm just puzzled about that. Is it one's commercial and one is homebrew? Yeah, well, I don't know. There's no there's no manufacturer I know that's selling 600 ohm uh, open wire line ready made like the 450 ohm slotted stuff. It's lower loss, of course, uh, is one of the one of the reasons. It it, uh, but there's I can't see any particular reason. For using 600 over 450 except that it's a it's somewhat lower loss but uh un unless unless the antenna they're using it with they're using the the line itself as part of the matching network and then then that might uh, have something to do with it but then i'd have to look at the per particular the, the particular setup that's being used it's like the uh it's like the g5rv for example uses a piece of open wire line as a part of the matching or the, uh, the, the 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 tuning that gets done at the antenna, then you then the kind of line you use uh, has uh, enters into the as enters into the design, but it probably could be redesigned for a different impedance line. It just that. Yeah, that's awful... interesting. You know, these these gentlemen are. Uh up in the Rochester, Syracuse area, and they are purists, and they send people down to Home Depot with a magnet to buy their spool of copper wire to build a half-wave 160-meter dipole that they feed with this 600-ohm wire, and they make both the antenna and the feed line with solid copper wire. That's the reason for the magnet. There's no iron in that. There's no steel. In other words, it's not copper clad wire. So that's why they send people off to Home Depot and tractor supply and electrical shops with a magnet in their pocket. Very interesting. Yeah, this this sounds like people who bought into various old wives' tales about. Uh, but I, you know, I I can't throw rocks from from this distance. <laughs> no, no. One last thing, coax. How long? of a 50 ohm LMR 400 line, would you run from the back of your uh, gear, from the back of your bench through the wall and then to a ballon outdoors so you don't have to deal with bringing that open wire line into the house? Is there an advantage to getting to the ballon with coax? 
you're asking me how much how much LMR four hundred am I willing to run from my transmitter to my you know, to my three antenna? Feet, ten feet, or is it just negligible and part of the wives' tails? I'm I'm not quite comprehending your question. Okay, from your operating bench, you have to get yes. outside, and I'm suggesting if you were to mount your ballon. A twelve to one or a nine to one, whether you're six hundred or four fifty, you'd run one side of that fifty ohms to your operating bench coax, and the other side of that ballon would connect to your ladder line or your open wire line. I'm, my question is: Is there any standing wave on that piece of coax that's three, ten, or twenty feet long going to that ballon from your operating bench? Well, not a, not if the other end of the open wire line is properly terminated. No. If everything is properly terminated, there is no standing wave in anywhere in this in the system. You're just merely extending that 50 ohm feed point or impedance at the back of your transmitter, 10 feet or 20 feet to your ballon, and that's it. Bottom line. Yeah, you can use if the if the load at the at the final end is a proper match to the 450 ohm line coming back, and then it gets converted with a ballon, a nine to one ballon to 50 ohms, there should be no SWR in any of that line, in the coax or in the 450 ohm line. Understood. Thank you very much for your time and taking my questions. Okay, how I, much? I, I looked this up and it says it's polyethylene, so that's okay. What about polyethylene? This is this is made out of polyethylene, so that's okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Polyethylene is a good RF plastic. It's a nonpolar, nonpolar plastic, which means it it does not it reacts it lives very well in an RF field. Plastics okay. vary They're of two types, polar and nonpolar. And I do a whole talk on polar on plastics, uh, which is a lot of hams don't realize just because it's plastic doesn't mean it works well in an RF environment. Most plastics that we use don't work well in RF environments. Most glues don't work well in, in an RF environment. And, uh, and uh, uh, that doesn't mean that just because it's on an antenna doesn't mean it's bad. But uh, if it's subjected to uh, plastics that are subjected to a high RF field, there are only certain plastics that work well. Polyethylene, polypropylene uh, are, are the good plastics uh, in common use today. Uh, How much power can you run with with open line? Or it's 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 only limited by the amount of current that the wire can tolerate. You can calculate back to the uh, to the amount of current. It's it, it's the ampacity of the line. I mean, for example, number fourteen gauge wire will handle thirteen amps. If you work backwards uh, with ohms ohms and watts law from from four hundred and fifty ohms and thirteen amps, that'll t and work it backwards. You'll find out how much power. But you can run all sorts of power with open wire line. Because they're debating whether they can they run fifteen hundred watts with six hundred ohm line. Well, sure, easily. Yeah, so those broadcast stations get much more power than that. Okay. Any more hands? How are we doing in chat there, Barry? In chat. Okay. Well, this is all right, guys. Well, thanks for having me. I've, I'll come back anytime you like. I've got other things to talk about and uh and uh I enjoy I enjoy speaking. That's a new a new aspect for me in ham radio, but it's been being one of the best the best of my career, which is now over fifty years. <laughs> this is part of the amateur radio. I look at amateur radio. I often say like a big pizza pie, and you just pick out the slice you want for what, and you get tired of that slice, we'll get a different one. And this is just added to it. Just another way the hands to get together and share and so forth. Uh, sort of like going to the pizza place to have a eyeball. Oh, now we can do it through Zoom worldwide. Okay. Zoom is a Zoom is a great asset to ham radio. In fact, to almost any club, uh, it's the best thing that's happened to to clubs 
<laughs> since sliced bread. Okay, guys, I'll say 73 to you, and we'll see you down the old coax. Okay, 73. So thanks again. Look forward to having you back on here again. Thank you all for coming. Yes.